Today we're going to be taking a look at some alternatives that you can use for treatment if you constantly dealing with gas, bloating, any type of discomfort in your abdominal area, and especially if that comes on pretty quick after eating. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Arland Hill out at Harvest Hills Ranch, and today we're going to take a look at what are some of your treatment options, and more specifically, what are some of your alternatives that you can consider when it comes to treating gas and bloating. A lot of times the, the immediate reflex uh, a response to this is to grab some type of antacid, something to help with the indigestion. And the reality is, is that while that may have the band-aid effect and give you some short-term temporary relief, the reality is, is that it's not getting to the underlying cause. And you may recall that when, if you've had an opportunity to look at any other videos that I've presented on this particular topic, we've delved into the idea that many times when individuals present very quickly with gas and bloating after eating, especially within that first 30, mi 30 minute window, most of the time that's going to be what we would call small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And again, there can be back, predominantly bacteria here, but you can also have fungus in this conversation as well. It's not uncommon to find fungus right along with that bacteria because of the same dysfunction that's occurring. But the idea for today's conversation is, and what I want to shed some light on is, or are treatment options that you can consider. Now, it's important to note that, first of all, what we are talking about here as far as small bowel or small uh, intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is sometimes referred to as small bowel bacterial overgrowth as well, is that by and large, this is generally unrecognized within the conventional model. Now, there is more acknowledgement to this than there has been in the past, certainly because of links to other conditions that are prevalent within our society. But when we start to follow the route of what typically happens here when this is accurately diagnosed, many times the treatment modality that's recommended is going to be some type of antibiotic. Makes sense. We're thinking about a bacteria, and logically, if we want to eradicate that bacteria, we would be thinking in the context of an antibiotic. And there are several antibiotics that have been considered uh, as a part of this conversation and that are often employed. Uh, things like metronidazole, uh, amoxicillin derivatives, uh, tetracycline. I mean, a lot of the ones that you've probably commonly heard of over the years or maybe even been prescribed are recommended for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which I'll just abbreviate as SIBO from here on. Now, the one, the antibiotic that is most prevalently recommended is going to be rifaximin, and that's the one I'm going to use for our comparison, uh, for comparison today. And so with that being said, let me give a little bit of context around rifaximin and what we need to know about that one. So rifaximin, as I said, it's the most commonly prescribed and rifaximin is it's an effective, uh, modestly effective antibiotic. Um, there's a there's a term that we use to understand how effective things are, and that's labeled as number needed to treat. And what I wanted to show you as I started into this part of the conversation around rifaximin is I wanted to share some data with you or show you some information. And first of all, let me under, let me help you understand this idea of number needed to treat and what exactly that is. And you'll notice here that it specifically says that number needed to treat provides a clinically useful yardstick. So it's a measure, if you will, of the effort required to have a beneficial outcome or to prevent a bad outcome with therapy. So what that means is that when we look at this number needed to treat, the higher that number goes, the, high, the more individuals it's going to take to have a successful outcome and to maybe stated oppositely or uh, in the opposite direction to avoid a negative outcome. So what does that mean in regards to rifaximin? Well, if we go and we look at some additional information here, you can see that this particular study is looking at rifaximin in the context of irritable bowel syndrome. And many times we find that SIBO is a uh, whether it's a causative factor or whether it's simply exacerbating SIBO, many times SIBO is linked to IBS. Um, so it can be exacerbating the IBS there to, to state that a little more clearly. Now, what I wanted to share with you in relation to 
this number needed to treat is that if we go down just a little bit on this paper, you'll see that it says rifaximin is an effective option for the treatment of IBS diarrhea with a number needed to treat of 10.6. So almost 11 is what we're looking at here. So that's that's a relatively high number. Uh, it, it is effective, but what that means when it's at an 11 is that it's going to take a reasonable number of individuals to see the outcomes that we're looking for and, and desiring. Now, some, some, some other considerations that we need to think about with rifaximin is that one, Rifaximin has a high price tag associated with it, and that in and of itself can discourage individuals from following through with it. Uh, typically, when you look at the administration course on this, you have to dose this about three times a day is typically how this is recommended uh, over about a 14-day course. Now, what I wanted to do as I shared, as I started out with this video, as I said, I want to give you some alternatives here. And with regards to some of these alternatives, I want to share some herbal options with you on this, some botanical options, I prefer to say with these. And with these botanicals, things like all of oregano, uh, wormwood, garlic, berberine, these types of compounds, these can show benefit as well. Now, some may look at this and say, well, is there substantial evidence behind this? And admittedly, the evidence here is not going to be as robust as what we think about with rifaximin and some of the other antibiotics out there. But we do have peer-reviewed data that we can point to and I want to share this with you because I did find that this was relatively interesting because these these botanicals were not only used in cases of SIBO and judged for their outcome but they were actually placed head-to-head -head with rifaximin which is not always the case in terms of what we're able to find and so you'll notice on this that this particular study shows that herbal therapy is equivalent to rifaximin for the treatment of SIBO and if we go down into the abstract a little bit there's even a bit greater understanding about what we see here which is that these herbal therapies are at least as effective as rifaximin so at least as effective as rifaximin for resolution of SIBO and that's when it's diagnosed by breath test. I'll talk about that in other videos. Diagnostics around SIBO is a whole other conversation. But also what we see is that herbals also appear to be as effective as triple antibiotic therapy for SIBO rescue therapy for rifaximin non-responders. So here's what that means. When you have someone who goes on a course of rifaximin and they don't respond to that, the next option for them from a conventional standpoint is to go the route of triple antibiotic therapy. And so for these non-responders to rifaximin, we see that when they were placed on these botanical combinations, that was equally as effective as the triple antibiotic therapy. So it can be considered as a rescue option when someone is a non-responder to the rifaximin. So it can be used initially, the botanicals can be used initially as an initial intervention or they can be used when someone has failed treatment with rifaximin as well. Now some of you are inherently going to ask, well what what was actually used uh, in regards to these botanicals and there are two named products, there's actually four named products specifically in this study that I'll go back and point to. But the reason I'm going to point to two of the four, and just allow me to scroll down here for just a moment. Uh, here we go. The reason that I'm going to point to two of these four, the first two, the FC Cytal and the Dysbioside, are two that I personally have um, experience with, quite a bit of experience with. Uh, this study actually used all four uh, antimicrobials, botanical antimicrobials, which does bring into play quite a few different compounds there. But the reason I bring up these two, the first two that you see here, the FC Cyto and the Dysbioside, is that these two particular antimicrobials I have found to be effective on their own, not even needing to go to the third and fourth option here. And when we look at the administration on this, you may think these are botanicals, they don't work as fast, you're going to have long durations of course of care here, and you may be thinking in the two to three, four month range, and that's not actually the case on this. Uh, in many scenarios, individuals can see success within 30 days. I, I typically, with my patients, run 30-day protocols with these antimicrobials. And I do follow a, a similar type of strategy to what we see with rifaximin, where I dose three different times throughout the day. But whether you're going the antibiotic route or whether you go the botanical route, three times a day is going to be your administration here. So point being on this, let's get to the, let's get to the heart of the matter here, which is 
that when we talk about trying to address this overgrowth that is going to be responsible for the gas and bloating and the discomfort, it can even lead into diarrhea, some individuals constipation. When we, when we look at the underlying cause for that, this overgrowth, these bacteria overgrowing, and even when we start to talk about fungus, the, the option for going for rifaximin or going for a lower cost botanical, which is going to be equally effective based on the evidence that we have, and is also going to have the ability to manage the fungus overgrowth at the same time, whereas with the antibiotic, we wouldn't see that, but we would expect the fungus to be there as well. It just makes more sense to go the route of the botanicals for a lot of individuals. Now, again, it's going to be a lot more cost effective to do this as well. Uh, you don't have the high price tag associated with the rifaximin. And the bottom line on this is that you're initially getting to the to the underlying cause by managing that overgrowth that is creating the symptoms that are keeping you in discomfort. And so I will say this as I kind of wrap, wrap things up here is that this is really step one in the entire process is that you want to go through the eradication phase or the reduction phase in this overgrowth. But it's not where the process within should end. And the reason I say that is because the relapse rate on this particular condition is high. It's in the mid 40% relapse rate. And that doesn't mean you relapse in four, five, 10 years. This is a relapse rate that's typically seen within nine months. And so this is going to recreate itself if we don't deal with some of the underlying uh, dysfunction that allow that overgrowth to take place and to, to begin to take place. But at the extent of not making this video exceptionally long, I'm going to save that for another conversation. Hey guys, if you are looking for more information about how to improve your health, go to drarlandhill.com. You'll find out about what I do and how I support patients there. And if you're looking for regeneratively raised, uncompromising food, go to Harvest Hills Ranch and you'll be able to see how myself and Leah raise animals and raise meats that are going to be uncompromised. Until next time, guys, we'll see you soon. I'm Dr. Arland Hill.